that's 10.30 or thereabouts, so I should make a start. Uh, just one intimation this week. Um, this past week has been a week of funerals. Uh, three took place. We've got one more to go uh, on Tuesday next at the church uh, for Jane Thorpe. Um, it's 12.15 at the church and then 1.30 at Dunfermline Cemetery. Uh, obviously under the Covid restrictions it's very difficult for people to come along. But please bear Jane's family in your thoughts and prayers this coming week. First hymn today <clears throat> is number 540. Uh, and there's at least a couple of tunes that can be sung to this. I'm going to go with Kingsfold. Uh, it's the one that I kind of grew up knowing this one. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down, the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, so weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give The living water, thirsty one, Stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank Of that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am the dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till travelling days are done. Let us pray. Lord of all, in reverence and humility, awe and wonder, we come to worship you. Meet with us now. We step aside from the busy routine of our lives, a few moments away from our daily activities and humdrum concerns, an opportunity to bring them quietly and prayerfully before you and to place them into your hands. We bring ourselves, our strengths and weaknesses, our faith and doubts, our hopes and fears. Meet with us now. We bring our families, our friends and neighbours, those we love, those we know and those we simply pass in the street. We bring our community, our town, our country and our world, places near and far, integral to our lives and far removed from our experiences. In quiet confidence we entrust all to your care knowing that your love is more powerful and your power more loving than we can ever know or imagine. As we think about the calling of Jonah and the disciples this day, we consider our own calling to be your disciples. We know that we have not been the ambassadors that you seek, for our faith has sometimes been weak. Our love has been poor, our motives have been mixed and our commitment unpredictable. And yet we still want to serve you and to live as you would have us be. Lord Jesus Christ, take us as we are, flawed as we may be, and use us in your service. Take what we say and do with all its blemishes and use us to bring a little light 
into the darkness of our world. Through your grace, accept our imperfect discipleship and work through us to share your love and to make known your goodness. Forgive what we have been and direct what we shall be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's fun trying to prepare services and then you remember that you haven't actually looked up the readings for the day. The first reading is, is from Jonah, uh, chapter 3. It's a story we know quite well and it reads as follows. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to the people there the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started from into the city, into the city and he proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let every one call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger, so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Into the book of Psalms, Psalm 62, my soul finds rest in God alone, my salvation comes from him, he alone is my rock and my salvation, he is my fortress, I shall never be shaken. How long will you assault a man? Would all of you throw him down, this leaning wall, this tottering fence? They fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Low-born men are but a breath. The high-born are but a lie. If weighed on the balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, that you, O God, are strong and that you, O Lord, are loving. Surely you will reward each person according to what he has done. If you scour the pages of Scripture, you will find very few people who answer God's call willingly or without complication. Moses, for example, came, he came up with excuse after excuse, one of them being that he couldn't speak well, and some think that he stuttered. I wonder what he would think of 
someone leading the United States with such an affliction. It took Samuel three goes before realising who was calling him. Remember that Eli had to suggest to him that it was God calling to him and not him. Isaiah perhaps is the only one who says, here I am, send me. But even he is daunted by the task and is overcome by his own unworthiness. Few prophets, however, take off in the opposite direction to avoid the call. And Jorah did precisely that. What was his problem? Jonah fit into the prophet character type by questioning his call, but his real reason was that he just didn't want to go to Nineveh. Some would give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he had an inner bias against them, while others would say that he was really something of a bigot. Given that he was willing to get a ringside seat to watch as the fire from heaven bombed down to destroy Nineveh. He hated the notion of these people hearing God's word. Worse than that, I think he feared forgiving them. At least God doing that. And that's perhaps implied in his reaction to God's mercy. The reluctant prophet Jonah, the man who ran from his calling and yet was forced to fulfil it, is something of an enigma. He came to realise that, as the storm hit the ship in his story, that there was no escape from God's will and God's call, except, he thought, to die. But the appearance of the big fish, no, it was never a whale, thwarted even that plan. He eventually turns up in Nineveh, and he must have been quite a sight. Having been vomited up by this fish on a nearby beach, he wandered into the city and only said eight words in the English translation. And the whole city believed him. Preachers everywhere must have a sneaking streak of jealousy. Eight words and a whole city converted. Most of us preachers spend hours and days crafting our sermons with very little effect. Often. Now I say this because in my first ministry and about my third year I tried an experiment where I repeated a service word for word one year after the original. And only one person noticed. And that was because there was something familiar about an illustration that I'd used. Me Jealous of Jonah? If I'm honest, I probably am. It would be wonderful to see a huge response to a sermon or a talk, to see people committing their lives to Christ, and that should be the aim of every sermon and talk. It should be the aim of every believer, to tell people about Jesus in the hope that they too would become Jesus' followers. We each have a ministry to fulfil, one that we are called by God to perform. Some of us will use words like preachers, while most of us will use our actions, our willingness to go that extra mile. I stumbled across a Facebook show called Returning the Favour. Uh, and the premise of the show is to seek out people who are doing good and great things and, and reward them for doing that. They never seek a reward. That's not what they're trying to do. And they're often found digging into their own savings in order to help people who need that little hand up. One helper was a seven-year-old boy who had seen that there were older folk who were really struggling because of the coronavirus. He asked his mum how much he had in his bank and decided, with her permission, to use that money to make help packs for around a hundred older folk. His generosity inspired others to help him with food donations and other ways. The programme got wind of this and they arranged for him to get his money back and to give him another $10,000 to help him do more. We none of us do things for the sake of reward, but it is nice to see people recognised for doing the right kind of stuff. In a world where there is so much tension and hate and distrust, 
it is inspiring to be made aware of all the good things that go on under the radar. God is still at work. Even though some of us are a little bit reluctant and may be fearful of doing our bit, God does not abandon his prophets or his disciples. Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. As some of you are saying, glory to his name. Let's keep on serving. Let's keep on listening to God's call for us. The next hymn's number 543, Longing for Light, We Wait in Darkness. Longing for light, we wait in darkness. Longing for truth, we turn to you. Make us your own, your holy people, light for the world to see. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Longing for peace, our world is troubled. Longing for hope, many despair. Your word alone has power to save us. Make us your living voice. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts. Shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light. Shine in your church. Gather today. Longing for food, many are hungry. Longing for water, many still thirst. Make us your bread, broken for others, shared until all are fed. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Longing for shelter, many are homeless. Longing for warmth, many are cold. Make us your building, sheltering others, walls made of living stone. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Many the gifts, many the people, many the hearts that yearn to belong. Let us be servants to one another, making your kingdom come. Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gather today. Our third reading comes from Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. 
at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. We're thinking about the calling of God and my own calling to ministry was not exactly straightforward. It really started with a throwaway remark by a Christian student who was helping run a church youth group in my church. It was called the Manhole Club because you could drop in any time. It's an old joke, but uh, it worked then. Uh, and I was a founder member who jumped across the table to help run it. The students encouraged me to join one of their Bible study groups and eventually they made me an honorary leader of the group in their last term in university. It was quite a privilege. And it was at one of those meetings that that comment was made. Now, I laughed all the way down the stairs and most of the way home in the car because I had a job as a furniture remover and I was quite happy with that. And the time, uh, at that time, I was really just enjoying it. But something, however, started niggling at me. And I went to talk to a retired minister uh, and he had led several SU camps over the years and was a respected leader in my congregation. And we chatted around the subject and he wisely suggested that I leave it for a year and see if the nickel was still there. I did. It was. And I, I was then encouraged to apply for the selection school uh, at the time to test that call. It was a three-night, four-day residential course at St. Combs College in Edinburgh. And I arrived and I was given room number 13. Now, it was the St. Andrew's room. Uh, and they were trying, I think, to put me at some kind of ease. And I thoroughly enjoyed all those IQ tests and quizzes and most of the interviews I had to do. There were committee exercises to do where we had to lead discussions on topics that no one could have prepared for. And we had a letter writing exercise to do as well. And I thought very little about it afterwards until I got the letter saying that congratulations, you are now a candidate for the Church of Scotland ministry. Which was a bit of a shock because I then had to apply to university to get a place there to study. And it would be a prescribed course uh, with my two years fairly firmly mapped out. St Andrews said yes, which was great. I could live at home, I could still golf myself silly, still do the work, and at least that's what I told myself. Edinburgh also said yes, presenting me with something of a quandary. Uh, and it was golf that I had to set aside a bit to answer the call. Aberdeen gave me two days notice for a possible interview, and Glasgow said no. So I chose Edinburgh, and I struggled through my first year. I met Dale that first year, which was a major plus, and passed two of the courses in my first year, but had to reset church history. It was said in New College at the time, I don't know if it still is, that if Jesus himself came to sit the course, he would only get 80%. So hard was the marking in that department. My director of studies, a Carmelite priest, proved to be a very wise guide. And when I had done the reset, I had to go to him to find out my result because I was entering my second year without the results in my hand. My problem was that if I had failed that course, I would face a last ditch effort in my fourth year with no hope of honours, which really wasn't on my horizon at the time anyway. So I was prepared to face the worst. The pass mark in New College at the time was 50% and my recent score was 50%. In my Director of Studies' words, you have passed, not with a lot of distinction, but you can now forget that now. If I needed any kind of confirmation about my call to ministry, this was surely it. It's good when you get these little signs and that you're doing the right thing, these little confirmations, these little reassurances. It must have been frightening for the original disciples to drop everything and follow this stranger. But they got to witness great things. They got to receive great teaching, all to prepare them to live out the message that they were sent to spread to the world. 
it's a frightening and scary prospect today and more so if you are not trained for ministry with a capital M and the dog collar. In the Kirk, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. And that implies that every single believer has a ministry to follow through on. We are all called to serve in a myriad of different ways and we have multiple giftings that we can put to good use. Listening, baking, chatting, being there for someone. Like President Biden said in his inauguration address, there are times when we need a hand up and other times when we could be offering that hand to others. Answering God's call is an attitude of mind. It involves service, humility, faith and love. It's never about what we can get out of it, but about what we can put in to encourage people to do good things, to always lift people up. There is a, a kid's song written by Stephen Fishbacker called Build Up. It sums it all rather well. It's often used in primary schools. It build up one another, build up your sisters and brothers, build up one another, build up. Every word you say, every game you play, every silly face, every single place, you can build up. Or you can tear down. Build up one another, build up your sisters and brothers, build up one another, build up. Every joke you tell, every name you spell, everywhere you go, everywhere you know, you can build up or you can tear down. Can you build up? We can build up. Can you build up? Yes, we can. Every song you sing, every bell you ring, everything you spend, every special friend. You can build up or you can tear down. Build up one another, build up your sisters and brothers, build up one another, build up. We can serve by building people up rather than trying to pull folk down. Every positive comment, every supportive thing that was said builds people up and encourages people. You can imagine the reverse of that. But that's not what we're called to. What is God calling you to do? How can you serve him where you are and in the current restrictions? I'm sure you could think of a few very positive ways. I've just noticed that Tom and Ellen have joined us. Welcome. Let's pray together. On this special Sunday, when the church worldwide considers Christian unity, we thank you for our brothers and sisters who worship in other churches of Scotland, and also those who worship in other denominations, whether Catholic, Episcopal, Baptist, Salvation Army, Free Church, and there are others. We give thanks for the myriad talents and skills in each church, and the way in which we can work together to serve a common purpose, the spread of the good news about Jesus. You, Lord God, have put love in our hearts and hope that we have in common. You have given us a rich heritage, inspiration through examples of faith, the insights of different traditions and the challenge of diverse experiences. Help us to learn from one another never closing our minds to the diversity of your church. Help each of us to share what you have done for us, to grow in faith day by day, to listen to what you have done for others so that our faith may be deepened and our service enriched and enhanced as we continue our individual pathway of faith and on our pilgrimage together. We pray for your world a world that has changed in recent days with a new president and with news of vaccines being distributed apace. We pray for President Biden and his administration as we pray for all governments, that the needs of the many would be the focus of power, to alleviate poverty where it is found, to confront injustice and hate with love and fairness, and as the prophet said, let justice flow like a river. We pray for our own community and for our church, 
for those we know who grieve at this time, for those who feel isolated and alone. Gracious God, help us to see how we might become answers to our own prayers by listening to your Spirit, prompting us to do the small good things that help to lift someone's burden. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last hymn is number 549, How, how Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many souls to glory Behold the man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there My pardon he accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from all of this? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Go in peace. Serve God in the way that you've been gifted to do. May the God of peace go with us as we travel from this place. May the love of Jesus keep us firm in hope and full of grace. God bless everybody. Take care. Be safe.